Good afternoon and welcome to Turbo Tortoise Tech. If you're new here, my name is Reese for Peace from KFC or Wookie Triple XL. Whichever you prefer, I actually don't really mind, to be quite honest. Um, <laughs> and behind me, or off to my right at least over here, is a test bench. And on that test bench, right now, is the second most powerful gaming chip in the world, the 5900X. And here I have a pile of chips. These two are the 5600X and 5800X. And then, most importantly, the most powerful gaming chip in the world. Of course, the AMD processors have notable performance on multi-threaded. It's actually become a case of just pick as many cores as you need for whatever task you're going for at this point in time and then the gaming scaling was quite uh, well it actually was quite far apart like a 3300x to a 3600x was actually quite a gap but now with the 5000 series it looks like those gaps are becoming infinitesimal and you're actually going to a point where you don't have to pick multi-thread into a single core, you can have both. Now in this review, I'm focusing on single core and gaming performance because on multi-threaded, it's basically been a one horse race since they dot with Ryzen. I've actually owned the 1800X, the 2700X, and now I'm using the 3950X, uh, at least on my old X470 Pro motherboard. Uh, there is some performance increase to an X570, but it's like three to 5%. So it's not that intense, but to make sure that we test everything as thoroughly as possible, I have requisitioned the build over here from Asus on the new Tough series. I have to say, these tough components are really, really well put together and the value for money that Asus is bringing with this rebrand is really, really good. While the look and feel might not be for everybody, the overall like value, as I've noted, is just that, it is just that good. This 3090 that I've got here, for instance, has six MLCC stacks where most brands use two on their 3090s and then four of the cheaper pop caps. None of that from Asus because absolute mad lads. Now this setup specifically, I have a couple of key components here to really try and draw the most out of the system. The only one that's maybe a little bit under spec is the Clev 3600 megahertz kit, which is at CL18. So it's kind of like a CL16 3200, more like a 3400 CL16. So there will be some performance increase from 3200 megahertz from this it being a bit faster, but once again, it's going to be a three to four percent, but at least it's sort of giving you the max value sort of speed from that RAM setup. Then we do have the H100R cooler, which I've left in the default stock format for this sort of testing, just to see what a normal 240 millimeter without any uh, added variants and stuff would go into it, because it's probably going to be the, what the majority of you guys buy, at least I hope you do, with the 5000 series or uh, 12 or 16 core processor, at minimum I would suggest a 240. If you can get a 280 or 360 for your build, that'll obviously be better, more surface area, better cooling. So starting off with the motherboard, it is, like I said, the Tough X570 Plus has 13 shakes in a 12 plus one power phasing system. So there's going to be absolutely no lack of wattage going to the chip. I have made sure that none of the performance bias stuff or weird LOD bias uh, stuff is enabled. So these chips are running effectively at their intended factory stock levels. Then we have, like I said, the 3600 megahertz RAM kit the 390, and then my Hick Vision 8000 SSD is making another appearance, a 2TB NVMe, so all the games and everything are running actually off the NVMe itself. This is all then powered by a, our good old Antec 850 watt gold, so it's got good, did, well, for a single uh, GPU setup, it's got some decent power delivery. Another just notable thing about the Tough 3090 is it only actually uses two 8 pins, even the Strix 3080 uses three 8 pins. So that's kind of interesting, especially when you've got so much power being delivered on the chip. So, well, so safely like that, you think it would need more, but it, it actually doesn't. And the, the results are actually almost exactly in line with the other 3090 that I tested. Another cool thing that they're doing is some pass through cooling. So there is actually air being pushed out through the back of the card through a little hole there in the heat shield, which is actually quite nice because most of the time it would just come out straight the side or straight into the motherboard. So at least where it clears the motherboard, it can come straight up and not add any 
extra heat into the system. So without further ado, without further gilding the lily, let's look at some gaming benchmarks. And frankly, it's just the best. I mean, especially in things like CS Go, right, which honestly show single thread performance and CPUs probably the most viscerally, you're looking at like a 15% uplift over what was best previous gen. The 5900X does keep in tow with the 5950 and it actually beats it in certain areas. The only thing I can put that down to was ambient temperature and for some reason the GPU was driving itself a little bit harder. If you look at things like Unigen you'll notice the temperature on the GPU was actually going a little bit higher than it did on the 5950X runs. But both of these processors absolutely stomped on Team Blue. For single core performance, they are unequivocally the best processors you can buy right now for gaming. And then, like I said, you have that multi-threaded bonus of them being 12 and 16 core processors. So if you are doing development workloads, rendering out video or anything like that, it's going to be fantastic as a dual purpose chip. The Cinebench runs were were especially interesting, specifically the R20. It's the first time that I've seen the single core performance multiplication actually be lower than the general core count. The uh, the 5900X did do a 12 point something, but the 5950 did a 15 point something. It didn't actually break the multi-threaded sort of workload that's happening over there. Normally that's the case. Normally it takes the single core performance and it multiplies it out so many times that it's it's generally ahead and that's been the case with pretty much every Ryzen first, second and third gen chip that I have tested. But now because of the restructure of the internals of the chip, it's actually become more of a single core performer. With it, with now having that many cores, it's a zero sum game over at, uh, at Intel's side to be honest. What they've done quite critically and differently is unify the caching system. So before you would have a couple of banks running a quad core or an eight core sort of setup but you'd always have at least two ccx's now that area has become combined into one massive caching system that can access all of the cores simultaneously because of that there's no more intercore latency that we were seeing before so for single core or dual core sort of performance workloads two cores can work much quicker together now than they did before and that's why you're getting that massive single core performance uplift as far as cooling goes these basically never went over 74 degrees the fan curve as you can see now is exactly what it was there before i mean if i even if i go right here with a microphone you're here it's like a pleasant little hum there's absolutely no way you would even hear that if it was in a pc case of course that does mean that it's going to affect the temperature though it's probably going to add about 10 to 15 degrees to your overall temperature scores especially where your gpu is concerned that's why i like open air testing because there's no interference so we're not limited by the thermal efficiency of the case to get the most out of the processor and the GPU. Now because of this environment in which AMD has found themselves, they're actually able to increase their pricing ever so slightly. All of the chips are getting a $50 bump, which is not really the end of the world considering that now the 3900X and the 10900K are on par in pricing with each other and clearly not on par when, where performance is concerned. This does, however, lead me to believe that the 5600X is probably going to be the best processor out of the bunch, at least where gaming value is concerned. You're not going to have bottlenecks on literally any GPU. So, to test if it is going to be the best or not, well, at mid-range, I suspect I'm, I'm, I'm doubting that it's not going to be the best value gaming processor around, actually. So. To test that in, what I'm going to do is put it on this exact motherboard, but with my 2070 Super, and then pair, and then match it up against the 3950X. I'll do the 5800X simultaneously because we want to test, you know, everything that we can. So I'll do both of those in the next review. But for this one, that is all we have time for today. So if you guys have enjoyed this review, do hope. I have no idea where I was going now. If you guys have enjoyed this review, then do hit us up with a like and subscribe, and then I'll get those other 5600X and 5800X stuff done, and I'll see you on the flip side.